helping to run the show. In this episode, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do a full three-round mock draft with our film guru, Cole Jackson. You may notice, no Jimbo tonight. Jimbo is taking care of much much more important matters. Um, and so we're certainly wishing all, all the best uh, where he is and what he's up to. But um, we're happy to be here and happy to get into it. Cole, how are you doing tonight? Doing good, yeah. Jimmy's uh, Jimmy's in the trunk of my car right now, so I'm taking over four times sports talk uh, <laughs> with Jimmy and Cole. That's uh, that's going to be the Jimmy new, and Cole uh, with Glenn and Cole, man. Or with, with Glenn and Cole, it's because I'm I'm looking at the uh, it says James and Glenn on the banner. <laughs> say that, <laughs> and I'm on Jimmy's side. Um, so uh, no, I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for having me on to co-host this and. Of course, all jokes aside, sending my absolute best to Jimmy and his family. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Big time. Little Trev, what's going on? Uh, having a great day. It's a beautiful day down here. It started off a little bit nasty, but it turned around in a big way. And let's hope that the O's can turn this game around because they're down early, but they are going to bounce back. And I might be watching the game while I'm doing this. There's a chance. There's a chance. But look, we're excited to get into it because, man, this draft is – I mean, we say it every year. It's a pivotal draft. It's a pivotal draft. But it feels like this is a big draft this year. So uh, I can't wait to get into it. And here, I'm going to have you help me because I know you do a ton of mocks. I want you to uh, to give me a hand in, in setting what you feel is the most accurate sliders on this PFF uh, mock draft simulator here because I, I want this to be as close to reality of what we're going to see on the 28th as possible. So You know what I like to do on this? Yeah, tell and me. It, I, I like the way it's set, but the randomness one, mm -hmm. I always put it up one. And so the reason I do this, and I want to be very clear about this. Everybody gets stuck in mock draft group think where – Guys are rated as a certain thing based on where they go in the media mocks. Mm -hmm. There's no better example than Kyle Hamilton. The yeah. amount of people that said there's no way, no way mm -hmm. Kyle Hamilton would be there at 14. And there he was there at 14, right? So it's right. It, this type of shit happens every single draft. Mm -hmm. And I love doing the thing I like about mock drafts. I know people get exhausted of them. I don't blame people. It is a lot. But the reason I like doing them is because it makes you think on the fly. Like if this happens now, what do I do? And that's why these can be so fun, especially when they're done live where you can't like restart to get your best outcome. Mm -hmm. You got to kind of think like a GM would you see, you know, if you have five guys on your board, 10 picks to go that have red stars and all five go, you're in a, Oh shit. What do you do situation? So I absolutely love doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I like doing these, but so I always turn up the randomness just a little bit. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, all right. So we'll, I did put that up one tick. Uh, how about the other sliders? Do you because they, they see they leave it default to lean heavily towards the public opinion rather than their own board? Do you typically leave it that way as well? Uh, I don't actually usually play with that. Also, I just adjusted my mic. Oh. Someone in the comments said my mic sounds wrong. So if that sounds better, just someone let me know. It does. Sound um, I had it on my. Okay, yeah, it was going through my MacBook. That's why it sounded like Appreciate it, Jax. Like Shout out to Jax. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jack. Yeah. Appreciate you, brother. Um, yeah, no, I usually don't play with that, but okay. Um, public okay. would just be the where the the ADP is. Um, oh, is that versus, what that means? Where okay. their rank is. Okay. All right, cool. So we'll keep it there. Uh, are we doing any trades, Cole? Do you do you want to go that cuz I can put the the speed down to slow and we can stop it if we need to. So I've been playing around all week with trading up and it's going to be a little bit more boring in a three in a three round because I've always been trading that second round pick. Yeah. Um, so I think maybe let's leave it off for right yeah. now. Maybe maybe we'll trade down because I think that's the more plausible scenario for as sure. much as I've been mostly playing around with if one of those top <laughs> three, top four tackles falls into the mid teens mm -hmm. and you're giving up a second round pick. Is it worth it? That's kind of where I think my head's been at in terms of having a thought exercise. But I just I know the Ravens aren't going to do it, so it seems like a waste of time. Um, they're always going to be trading back if they're trading. So let's leave it on. We'll get to thirty, and we'll see what happens there. Now, do you, if you were advising, if you had the ultimate power to advise Eric DaCosta to do whatever he you say he does, 
would you say, look at your history as in second round drafts as of recently, would you advise against him keeping that second and say, you might as well trade that thing and go up and get your guy? It, I, it, it's it's got to be something. It's I, I, I know they'll never ask, but I'd love to get like even just an offer off record, you know, answer because like it is bad. You you it's have crazy. some hits. You have, you know, like uh, Tory Smith, Emily, Tory Smith, uh, Courtney Upshaw was a productive yeah, player. Solid. Like, but but mostly it's been bad. And like J.K. Dobbins was obviously a good player, hampered by injuries. So I don't think he's necessarily in that bus conversation. But mm-hmm. you got Art Brown, Cam Carrera, Correa. Um, you know who's they just Sergio had some, Kindle. Sergio Kindle. Like it just feels and like David Ajabo to the po- this point. Yeah, yeah, it's just been a wasteland. So I mean, I don't think. The way a GM thinks, there's no way he's thinking I can't make picks in the second round. It's like, it's like the wide receiver conversation. I don't think the Ravens would be like, we can't draft wide receivers, so we're just not going to. And Eric DaCosta said it himself: we're going to keep swinging. And that's how, a, if you were to ask him on the record, he'd say we're going to keep swinging in the second round. Like that would be his standard GM answer. Mm-hmm. Um, but it does make you wonder, right? When you look at the history and you're like. Why can't we hit there? Like, it's such a bizarre part of this. Yeah, especially because they seemingly do so well in the later parts of the draft. Yeah. Uh, far better than in the second. But uh, all right, so we're going to we're gonna act as if they're going to not trade up, but we might work a trade back, okay? Ladies but and I'd gentlemen. love to hear your thoughts. Like, chat, let us know. What do you guys think? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll go forward with this, mm-hmm. but I'd love to yeah. hear from you guys. Yeah, and we're going to go – we're going to have it set at, at, at slow. So if you – See one of your guys, Cole, because I know you got a handful of guys that are your guys. If you see one, don't hesitate to to you know have me pause, and I certainly yeah. will, and uh, and we'll get uh, we'll get your guy. But let's take a look at how this starts. And I always get frustrated when it doesn't start with the obvious, which would be you know I think everyone knows Caleb Williams is going number one. So I did a couple of these where it wasn't him, and I'm like, I don't even want to continue this mock. It's so like that see. randomness one that I told you to turn up. That's probably what it's – what did it go with? Did you hit it? Oh, I thought you hit it. It's starting yeah, to move. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Here <laughs> we go. Weird. Start your draft. All right. There we go. Okay. okay. We're off on the this good This is a foot. legit draft then. Now we're, now we're on track. You know, uh, in one second, I, I like uh, – I've, I've seen uh, certain people's take on Drake May, and it seems like he's one of the more polarizing guys. Some people think he's the next Mitch Trubisky, the next bust to come out of North Carolina. And, you know, a guy like Merrill Hodge, I remember he was f- famous for a lot of his takes on guys that were considered to be highly ranked. And he was like, you take this guy and he will he will get you fired. What's your take on Drake May before we go any further? The biggest thing that I'm actually concerned about with him is that if you look across the board, the biggest weakness on him is his decision making. <laughs> and that is like no one's questioning his arm talent. He, re- I think uh, so he won't have the rushing ability, but in terms of that early quarterback ability, I think it could be a lot like a Josh Allen situation where it's going to be a lot of mistakes, a lot of bumps. Like if you go back and look at Josh Allen in his first two years, it was rough. And then mm-hmm. he just flipped the switch, right? Now he's moved himself into the upper echelon. Um, so I think it's going to be that type of start to his career. And it's really going to test not only his mental fortitude, but the team he's on. So I I, I would imagine he's going to be on the commanders, um, mm-hmm. a team that's been trash for ever and it's just going to be a question of how can they surround him with talent how can they limit that margin for error and can they continue to support him and not turn on him as he goes through the growing pains yeah it's i would yeah man Jaden daniels man i don't know he seems like an exciting exciting prospect but hey they like drake may more at least in this mock let's see what let's see what happens now caroline or i'm sorry uh cardinals are on the clock Dunes A. Wow. wow, there you go. First wide receiver taken. Oh, and there goes the tackle. First tackle, Joe Alt. No shocker. Marvin Which Harris. Feels like Joe Alt to the Chargers feels weird when they have a left tackle, but oh, that is a good point. That is a good point. I it, mean, they could see the right tackle ability in him. I believe he did play right tackle first when they had uh, in 2021 when they had a left tackle, but he's a stud too. They got a stud left tackle. It's not like. Yeah, it's Rashawn Slater. Yeah, it's not like an iffy guy like we got here in, in Ronnie Stanley. Marvin Harrison, second one to go. And then Brock Bowers 
Is he going to be a game change? The next game changing tight end in a long list of ridiculously good tight ends. I think he's, I found it weird he didn't test, but I think he's going to be really good. It's going to be something. Yeah, let's keep an eye on. So, how many tack? There's still a lot. Okay, another tackle goes. So Fotanu is still available, and there goes Fuaga. So, yeah. So this is where I start to be like, well, you know, if 19 comes around, yeah, because let's see. They go tackle. Graham Barton goes. So, so hold available. on. As of it's right now, how many but, tackles? This is where I struggle because the Steelers have never trade back with us. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. Let's go one so more. The, the only one, one left more. is Fotanu. That's the only one. Okay. That's it's, the one left. Well, sorry. Mims and Guyton are available too. Um, sorry. Excuse me. I didn't mean to dismiss we'll trade up. We'll trade up worthy. Trade up worthy, I would say, Fotan. And this is where... You know, if you want to, you could offer 21 for 30 and 93. I know we're only doing a three round mock, so it kind of lowers the interest in that third round. Mm -hmm. But that's where this becomes a very reasonable discussion to move up to secure uh, Troy Fotanu out of the University of Washington, a guy that I think could come in and start at right tackle right away and then be your long term left tackle. That's what you're getting if you make that move for him. How do I look at players right now? Is there a way on this? Do you know? If you scroll down, like if you look at, like, what do you mean? How can I look at the board? What's available? oh, who's available? Uh, yeah. Is there a way on question. here? No, I was, gonna, show, I was yeah. just gonna pull up his uh, his name or his uh, profile. That way, you could speak to it. But well, let's just let's try this. Let's see in a hypothetical situation. So they would, at least in theory, there's an eighty percent chance that they would take that trade. Yeah. Now in if if the Ravens... offer one thirteen, would they take one thirteen, and then we could kind of rock on that? Because that's not nah. nah. Like it's... Well, we probably have to like sweeten the pot with a bunch of extras, but yeah, uh, which then you're just could, playing but... Madden, <laughs> yeah, exactly. and it doesn't feel realistic. Yeah, you know? no. But okay, all right. So we're not gonna we're gonna resume the draft at least yeah. to this point and see what. I what think happens. the positive here is we might be seeing the tag. I think there's probably they're probably gonna take yeah. So they took Tro Fortano. So mm -hmm. which makes sense. So now Ooh. we're hoping. Now I gotta get your take on this guy because Jimmy is absolute. He has an absolute man crush on Cooper DeGene. and yeah. and he fell in love with the fact that he's a multi sport athlete and not just any multi sport. But he went all state in like four different sports in, in high school, which is absolutely insane. There's video of him absolutely dunking off pe on people off vertical. Like, not even like off right. He's like going in the post, turning off, spinning, and jamming on dudes. And then I see he tests in the top 1% of all corners in the last, like since since I was born or something crazy. What? Yeah, and that, he just tested, right? Because he didn't test yeah. the combine. So, uh how are people still saying that this guy can't play? I don't understand. What's what? What, what am I missing, Cole? Uh, I, I my take on his game is he plays with a lot of stiffness, and so that is a big concern to me. Um, but he's just he's he's the best tackling DB in this class, the mm. absolute best tackling DB in this class. So he's an immediate help on special teams day one. Well, yeah, and he, I mean, he's just physical, and he has that ability because of that physicality to fit in their scheme where they just want to move guys around. So he doesn't just have to be an outside corner, which in a situation with Marlon Humphrey and uh, um, Brandon Stevens as you're kind of starting outside guys, if everybody's healthy, you can get creative like they do with Kyle Hamilton to get three guys. So he could probably play a little bit of safety, play a little bit in the slot, um, and then some of those big slots you'll see teams put out there, you get some matchup opportunities with having both Hamilton and Dijon, and you can just kind of move them around to, to be chess pieces. And that's what I think he really brings to you, but he also brings enough skills to be that outside corner of the future that, you know, if Brandon Stevens walks for a new contract, Marlon Humphrey's contract situation is going to get complicated soon due to the cost. Um, and especially with his health concerns lately. Um, so I, you know, I'm definitely if he, he's one of those guys where if he falls to 30, he's definitely in that BPA situation for me. Um, so, yeah, no, all over this kid really like him. And you could you, you could see a scenario where uh, not only do him and Kyle Hamilton coexist on the defense, but they, that that's an absolute win and an asset for Zach Orr, huh? Absolutely. OK, I like it. I like it. Yeah, it'd be kind of cool. 
to see. But do you ultimately expect him to be gone before the Ravens do make their pick? Now I do, yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, because I think, it, I think those testing numbers probably – a lot of the – like the way teams look at testing numbers is a lot of it is checking boxes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just think that checked some of the boxes that they needed to see. Gotcha, gotcha, certainly. Um, all right, let's take a look. So really who I'm tracking right now is Mims and Guyton, and we want look to see at one of them. That's a big one. Now I so heard... we talked about this when I was on with you guys a few weeks ago. Yep. We talked about a player falling to the Ravens and what, what were a couple of the things that we needed to happen. And one of them was a run on quarterbacks. And yep. that's exactly what we just see right here. Yeah. And RG three called him the best passer in this draft just today on, on, uh, on X. So man, he, uh, he's getting some high praise and maybe that's the kind of praise we need to see for him to go flying up the boards. There, there goes Guyton. Guyton. That hurts. Not unexpected, though. Now, is Byron Murphy the type of talent where if he slides to 30, do you think he's so good? Like, even when they just paid Meta BK, yeah. could this guy be a, a I can't pass up type of guy? I think he is because I we need an edge rusher, right? Like, we we, we brought back Kyle Van Noy. There's a way, there's a Jabbo, but they need to bolster their pass rush. And I don't know about anybody else. I don't really give a crap if it's from the inside, from the outside. Mm-hmm. Um, so adding Byron Murphy, I can put him on the field in passing situations beside, beside Justin Matabike. That's no problem. Um, so I don't really see Matabike preventing me from investing in him um, as long as he's for sure, you know, the BPA. And he's that guy that like his pass rush win, way, win rate is the best in the draft. Um, you know, he's just an absolute beast and he can line up in the a gap B gap. You could even probably play him as kind of a, a four tech or four eye. So they they can just be so creative about where he is on the D line. Um, and then game planning inside for Matt BK and Byron Murphy would be a nightmare. No doubt. No doubt. He could be that guy. I mean, like that, that quarterback run, we never saw Bo Nix go, but you never know. Some team could have fallen, could fall in love with him and force another, Super talented guy back. All right, here we go. We got the Cardinals on the clock. They already went receiver, if I remember correct. Hold on. Did they go back to back? Did they not go receiver? Wow. Wednesday and wow. Back to back wide receiver. Which makes sense in their situation, right? They lost Hollywood. They're covered. Yeah. They got Trey McBride. I love Trey McBride. I had him on my fantasy team last year. What a gift for the late season push. Um, but wow. Okay. So they double down and surround Kyler Murray. So right here is where I'm on Mims watch. Cause that's where it looks like we're going to be making a decision. And but the, the bills are absolutely a team that could, could pick him to replace, uh, Spencer Brown. But don't they also have a massive need at wide receiver? And, aren't absolutely most not. and I think Adonai Mitchell would fit so well with Josh Allen. So that's interesting to see. Here we so. go. Let's see who they go with. Chop Robinson. Now look, Jimmy scared the death of Chop, and <laughs> I, I understand he goes to this same co- school as Adafi Owe. Didn't what was his production level like? It wasn't. It, it wasn't, no, it was about the, it was a similar situation. It's like three like, sacks, if I remember. I think it was more. Well, here let's pop it up so we're giving Actually, the listeners yeah, the yeah, correct yeah, information. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, three sacks this year, five sacks yeah. last year, two sacks the year before. Um, but I believe he didn't have as many snaps. Like I think he was hurt this year. Um, 148 pass rush snaps last. So game. yeah, like ha- he didn't play a whole ton. Only 300 total defensive snaps in 10 games. Yeah. Um, but it is that it's it's the fans don't want to hear it right now. It's it's you're picking him for the traits, and that's exactly what I told you guys when we drafted away. Um, so I get it. I get the PTSD, mm-hmm. and you know it's just I'm not as interested in that type of rusher i'd really like to replace with a with a clowny power rusher speed Mm -hmm. to uh, speed to power type rusher is kind of what i'm interested in kind of the marshawn neelans the mo camaras like those guys that are explosive but are more power rushers that'll work inside that's what i think the ravens are getting a little bit more success out of those types of rushers than these speed rushers that just don't seem to be able to get that development Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think people are hoping that he's more Micah Parsons than right Dafe Owe. But uh, I know DraftPlex absolutely loves him. I think he did mock the Ravens to him at one point, but he's starting to think that he's he's not going to be there. 
Uh, let's take a look here what the Lions ultimately do. They go Mims. Oh no, they go That's Mims. Killer. One pick would have been would have been an, a slam dunk, easy pick if he's still there. So I understand the so your the your opinion on Amarius Mims is going to be all about how you want to accept the injury risk that he brings with you, and so what I mean by that is he missed. So he played behind uh, the the guy that got drafted by the Steelers. He he played behind two two guys that are in the NFL now, and he actually entered the transfer portal before 2022 before deciding to stay at Georgia. And that just kind of said something to me because I think he was really happy with his coaching staff, was really happy with his development, and he decided I'm going to stay here, continue to develop as a player, and even though I'm not playing which hurt him. It's hurting his draft stock because he's not an experienced tackle, right? He didn't really play in 2022. He mostly rotated in. Then 2023 comes around. Those guys are gone to the league. It's his time to shine. And I think in week two, he, he got ankle surgery, had to get tight rope, or he had an ankle injury, had to get tight rope surgery. And uh, then when he got back, he was able to finish the season. But then at the combine, he hurt his hamstring uh, running the 40. So he's it's just it's all about how can you manage the injury risk? Steelers, Broderick Jones. Thanks, DK. Um, so it's it's how can you manage that injury hit, risk with Mims, knowing that every time Ronnie Stanley gets anywhere close to the quarterback, you wince because you're worried he's going to get rolled up on. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want that on both sides? And then do you have the depth to be able to manage you know two injury prone tackles if you're like i don't want to accept that risk i completely understand but him as a player is exactly what the ravens need he is mm -hmm. a very high level pass protector um he has all of the tools to develop he's gonna you know he's gonna have some lumps he's gonna need to get some experience um but he's big he's physical he's quick um everything that the ravens he's basically what they would have had in orlando brown jr as a right tackle um, where, you know, we've seen since he moved to the left side, he's a far better right tackle. Um, mm -hmm. And I think they'd be kind of recreating that, but with a more physical player. Wow. That would be, and if they do pass, say he's there and they pass on him, I guess not. It, I mean, they could, they could say it's due to the injuries, but also Tom Munkin has a pretty good idea of what Amarius Mims is as a player. And if he passes up on him, then that's kind of an indictment. I think. Yep. In one way, but he's not there nonetheless. We so, must have someone fall to us here. Well, yeah, we got. Well, as far as uh, I'm just sorted by best available right now. Uh, what's your What's your take on on Newton? Is he up there as far as uh, you know? Can't pass on this type of guy because according to their big board, he's the eighth overall player on their big board. Yeah, and I think the nice thing about Newton is he he played a little bit more um, a little bit more outside than just like as a three tech player. Um, so he brings a little bit more versatility, you know, playing kind of out to the five tech, um, playing over the tackle as a four tech, which will help him get on the field right away. Um, but he's just, I, I don't know, this isn't like a Byron Murphy situation where it's like, I need to have that defensive tackle. They did bring back most of their defensive line. Um, and I think they're going to be in good shape there. Byron Murphy is just a, he's that good. Um, so gotcha. that's no slight against Newton. He is as well. He's a first round talent. Um, but you know, I would have to, that's where my, I, I always want to go best player available, but I have to have some control for need in there as well. Certainly. Absolutely. Especially with the first round pick. Yeah. Uh, now cornerback, like you mentioned, I think it's becoming a bit, you know, of a need when you, when you consider like people are saying, well, we got, we got two pretty good ones on the outside and we do have some you know, some, some guys that can play inside, but it's like, man, what if one of those guys goes down and Marlon has certainly shown as of late that it's a very good possibility. He's not going to play 17 games is Kool-Aid McKinstry worthy of a first round pick. And is he a guy that could start and help day one? Yeah, I like McKinstry. Um, I, I like that. He's a big physical guy that brings some of that similar movability. Uh, some people have put him as a safety in the league. Um, as where they would, you know, I see him ideally. So again, from that kind of versatility perspective, a lot of the things we just talked about with Dijin, I think he can do that similar type of work. Um, so he definitely intrigues me in that aspect. Um, 
but not a huge fit. Like I'm worried about his athleticism at the next level. Um, I just, I worry about kind of his long speed, that sort of thing. So um, I'm really interested in how he's going to transition, but he had such a good 2023 year um, that he's got to be, uh, you know, he's, he's got to be up there. I think what really helps him is plays with a high football IQ has really good trail technique, um, which really shows that ability to kind of read and react. So that's one of the things that Brandon Stevens has really developed with. So, um, and I, I love corners coming from Saban's zone scheme. They just always seem to, you know, transition really well because they come with some of those instincts. Um, so, you know, I, I think he'd be, he's definitely, he's definitely there. He just doesn't have the explosive athleticism you want to see in a corner. Okay. All right. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, before I get your take on who you would take, if if they stay here, uh, I got to know, if it fell this way, does your gut tell you the Ravens try and trade back if there's a team interested? Because right now it's showing me three teams are interested. The Raiders are at 44, the Saints at 45, and the Bucks at 57. That seems like a pretty steep drop in my That's opinion. A big drop. Uh, but so, so here's my trade back scenario. If I'm trading back, what I'm trading back for is basically to move back, acquire some draft capital and get either Jordan Morgan or Kingsley Swamatea. Mm -hmm. And then that way I've moved back and I've addressed my day one right tackle this year. And okay. I've also picked up an extra pick. So if we move back to 44, one nice thing is we're going to pick up like another third, probably like mm -hmm. they'd have to give a decent little chunk of change for that, you know, 14 pick jump. Yeah. So that's nice. But if you get back to 44 and you've lost both those guys, which is likely they're going to go probably in short order mm -hmm. um, after pick 30. And, and this is where we unfortunately have to roll with where need will take over. So mm -hmm. I think we look at who's available right now. Mm -hmm. And I would say Newton and, McKinstry are pretty clearly the BPAs, right? Mm -hmm. And you could make a very solid argument that cornerback is a need, right? Because, you know, we have potentially Stevens gone next year. Um, one injury to those guys, and you're into the Jalen Armors Davises or a rookie or a veteran off the street as you're starting outside corner. So I, I think there's a very valid argument that corner is a need. Um, so that, you know, that's kind of what's screaming to me right now. Um, you could also make a very good argument for Jackson or uh, Jackson Powers Johnson. I always want to say that the, the last name is backwards because he could come in. He played right guard at Oregon last year um, or in 2022. So he's a guy that could come in and compete at guard right away. Uh, and he's one of the most outstanding interior linemen I've watched in quite some time. Love the kid. Wow. Like, like that him good. as a player, as much as I like Linderbaum, like he's that, he's that, that dude. good. Wow. So, but then you're drafting a guard at 30 and I understand some of the lim like the limitations that'll have on your draft class when you have other needs. So you think a team looks more gets, him as a center. Do you think a team that falls in love with him is, is it center? Yeah. Cause like, I think his best position as a pro would be center. Like I mm -hmm. feel like he's, he's got that all pro ability, but I think he could play guard. Um, gotcha. And he's one of the best zone blockers in this, uh, this scheme. So, or in this, draft so i think coming into this scheme he would be a really good fit to be at the guard position as well um he's got the physicality he's got the quickness he's got the uh the ability to get out in space and make those blocks so i like that aspect of his game but you know for and lad mcconkey's there too and that's a guy that i love his game so i know a lot of folks want the big physical x wide receiver um and that's not necessarily mcconkey's game but McConkey's a three level separator. Um, and he's just going to be that guy that's constantly open. I don't know, which does yeah. that sound nice to you guys? Cause it sounds, it sounds pretty nice good. Um, and I think he'd fit really well in this scheme. Plus the, the familiarity with, with Todd Munkin would be a nice aspect as well. Um, he's just, he's steady. He's solid. Um, I think he compliments Zay really well. So kind of building up that wide receiver core. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, there's some options here. Um, yeah, this one's, what this do you one's lean towards Gunny? Well, I tell you, I'm I've uh, already said I like uh I like McKinstry, but man, I just I just don't know if there's not just more pressing needs. I think ultimately if this was a real 
See, look, we're going to pretend that this is real. I would say I would think that the Ravens would most likely trade back in this scenario. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you this. Do you think that they are looking for – do you do you look at them, if they're going after a tackle, looking for a guy to play right tackle this year, but to transition to left tackle and take over for Ronnie when he's gone? Or do you think they're okay with getting a guy who's just the right tackle for the next 10 years on their team? I think they're going to be looking at both. And what I mean by that is I think a guy that can do that and provide that ability is going to be the priority. But I think they're also going to double up on tackle and get a guy that's a longer term developmental option. A Javon Foster, a a Patrick Paul, if he's in the right position, um, okay. I, I think he'll go earlier than they could. But, uh, you know, there's a number of tackles. This is a deep tackle class that they could really develop. They got, you know, Christian Jones out of Texas, Walter Rouse out of Oklahoma. Uh, she, there's, you know, a couple guys late, Brandon Coleman out of TCU. Um, so guys that I think they could get as long-term development guys um, that they're hoping they can get, you know, in the next year to be a starting left tackle. But the problem is it's just, you don't find too many left tackles around the league that aren't drafted early. Right. So that's where it becomes complicated. So a guy like a Tyler Guyton, who I think can make that transition becomes a bit more of a priority to me because he can play right tackle. He's been doing that at Oklahoma. And I think people don't realize Oklahoma last year had a, like 2022 had a uh, left-handed quarterback. So he has protected a blind side before, even yeah. though he didn't play on the left side, he was the right tackle for a left-handed quarterback. Um, so, you know, he's got that experience. He would just have to transition his technique. So that's really where I, that's why I was pretty high on Guyton, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, that's kind of like that type of player. That's like a day one, right tackle. That could also be a left tackle, uh, long-term I think is, is definitely the priority. And see the, the hesitation I have here is I, I think they need to come out of this with a tackle that could start day one. And I'm worried if they don't take him right now, that he's not going to be there at 63. So that's kind of the inner terminal I'm having right now. It's like, uh, can you pass on a guy now and get a guy like uh, out of, uh, let's see, uh, out of um, Notre Dame, the other, the right tackle out of Notre Blake Dame? Blake Fisher. Yeah. Is there a chance Blake could slip to 63? I, yeah. I those are know. the questions you got to ask. Or uh, Kieran Amadeja out of Yale could be a guy that could slip down there. Um, I, mean, I, I think I, Lad would be awfully tempting, though. I really do. I think Lad would be tempting for them. Yeah, and I saw someone in the comments say, "No way, McConkey's going before Keon Coleman." And what was the other player, Xavier Worthy? I think he absolutely could. I think he's that good of a separator. I think he's probably one of the best separators in the in in the draft. He's just that outside of the top three guys. Um, you know, that's just kind of his game, and it's all going to come down to play style at that point. Um, yeah. So Cole, I'm going to ask you this, Cole, if this is your team, you're Eric DaCosta. I would probably trade back to 44 and get that extra pick to be completely honest with you. You want to do it? I think so. Let's try it just because it's let's right. do different. Let's do something different. Okay. So, I like so, it. so let's try and grab 77. Okay. So 44, 77 for 30. They'll take it. And we're getting an early third here. So we're getting another shot in the top 100. All right, let's do it. Accepted. Okay. All right. Obviously, they're going quarterback here, which we we would. Oh, and they go with your guy, Kingsley. Gone. That's a hurt. Yeah. Oh, and then Max goes next. I know you like Max as well. Yeah, I like Melton a lot. All your guys are going. There goes Lad. Oh, no. Jordan. Oh, I know Jordan was mocked to us by uh, DraftPlex, who, who loves the. To, to watch those connections when he sees visits and, and, and all that. Oh, Xavier Worthy goes. I'm starting to regret this. Uh... Oh, no. They're all going. There goes Kool-Aid. He's gone. Patrick. Patrick Man. Paul. That's a tough one because that would have been part of the discussion. Oh. Rosengarten is there. Oh. They're all gone. I think we fucked up. I think we <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> There's not a decent tackle left. Oh, uh, who was it that uh, DK said that they, that uh, James? Uh... And just to address the chat, I completely disagree that I'm overusing separator because I just there's not that many guys in this draft that are getting elite separation like Lad McConkey, a guy that can run the whole route tree that is constantly getting open like that. You just don't see that. You look at Keon Coleman; he can't get 
any separation beyond five yard breaking routes. Like that's just mm-hmm. his game, right? So man, Bateman is a separator. How is that going? He's not though. Like well, he is if you if, if you, you don't want to look it. at the traits of a wide receiver and how they run routes and how that creates separation and how you can use timing within that. I don't know what to tell you. That's just basic draft analysis. Well, so moving what, back to I this, think, though, I think we the Ravens are in, would would we're in we, trouble. Like, let's yeah. be real. Like, we're in trouble here. This is- <laughs> Like Hold so, this, but this is why I like doing these scenarios because it yeah. shows we traded back. We got a nice pick. Seventy seven is a nice extra pick. Yeah, but oh, we are so in a bad spot. <laughs> like, yeah, like, um, what about Broswell? I mean, is he is he worthy of? Uh, you know, I mean, look, we need help at edge. Is he a guy that could help day one though? What do you think? I kind of like going wide receiver here. I think we have a ton of options. If we okay. look at just the receivers here, it. because we have a bunch of different skill sets. Okay, so we don't... So let's let's take a go. look at just the receivers. So Troy Franklin, you know, really nice option because if you go back to last year and how much they wanted to push the ball downfield mm-hmm. to Rashad Bateman, where that's not really his game, that's where Troy Franklin can kind of fit in as a big target and a guy that can get deep. Um, that's kind of where he shines. So that is definitely an area where they could fill what I think is a need and a skill set that they wanted to have. Well, the reason I hesitated with going, uh, just, just drafting McConkey at 30 is that they've already spent more draft capital at wide receiver over the last five years than any other team in the sport. So to think that they would continue to just dump top picks and, and first round picks into that position I mean, I guess it's possible, but it just seems like there's been a lot of first round wide receivers already. And now you're telling me, here we go. Another season where they're going first, first pick is a wide out. Do you you see, do you see that as a possibility still? In a trade back? I think it's more likely. I think it's going to be harder to sell at 30. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, now we're in a situation where we kind of screwed ourselves and we really have to look at at the BPA situation here, here. Um, which again, I love that we've put ourselves in this situation. Um, I mean, Roman Wilson, Ricky Purcell, they're more slot options. Okay. Um, so I really like their player profiles, but I'm just, you know, it's just, you're loading up on slot guys. Right. So I think they're, if they're going to go wide receiver, they're going to want that true outside wide receiver. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's really between, uh, Troy Franklin and Keon Coleman, two very different players, which is, mm-hmm. which is interesting. And, I'll take Jermaine Burton off their board because of the the incident that happened at the uh, Tennessee game. I just I don't know what they'll do there. I have yeah. I have no idea. Don't have enough details about it that I just I don't know where they'd kind of land on that. Mm-hmm. So Keon Coleman or man, I know the chat one is going to love some Keon Coleman. They love. I was a big fan of Keon Coleman. I, I he was one of my first videos that I did this year because the discourse on Twitter was driving me nuts about him. Um, I think Xavier Leggett already got drafted. Did he? He must have, right? He would already be up there. I would think so. I think. Oh, nah. He's right here. Oh, I'm going Xavier Leggett and running the card up. Really? Xavier Leggett. 100%. So now, so now I, I thought he was gone. You don't think we effed up now? You've changed that. I feel you, fantastic. I love this kid. Tell me about Xavier Leggett. He was one of my favorite watches this year. I absolutely loved what I saw from this kid. Um, I think he'll go... I thought he was gone because I think he's going to go earlier. Um, first round? I think he could go first round. I've seen a lot of Bills fans that like him at 28. I, I like a lot of them. I follow those cover one guys that are, that's kind of their top film analysis channel. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I just love Leggett. He's explosive. He works deep. He's got some of the best contested catch ability um, downfield. Uh, I think he, the only player that, kind of rivals Keon Coleman as a as a as a jump ball receiver is probably Leggett, but I think Leggett has that more explosive deep athleticism that mm-hmm. Keon Coleman doesn't have. Keon Coleman's very explosive underneath, mm-hmm. but he doesn't have the same long speed and I, that kind of comes out in a lot of his separation numbers because that was the that was the thing people saying Coleman couldn't separate, but then you'd watch him run anything under 10 yards and he would just absolutely blow by guys. Um, so, but I'm, I'm going, yeah, like it was, that was, look at that. 
That would be scary for me, though. Look, he ends up going to the Steelers, Keon Coleman. Imagine him opposite uh, Pickens. Just jump ball either corner of the end zone is, is going to get – is going to be tough to defend here. All right, here we go. Back on the clock. Okay, all right. So we filled the wide receiver position. That is no longer a need. So the question remains in my mind is, can they still get a tackle? And I, I, I'm I, not upset at all to see see some tackles that I think could start day one at right tackle. What's your thoughts on what's left? This is an interesting one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the kid from Yale... Mm-hmm. has this is where you the question i'd put to folks is do you want the high floor or do you want the high ceiling if you go with kieran i think you're gonna have some bumps right away mm. um just lack of experience he played through some injuries this year he went to a smaller school didn't play the same competition but he has every single tool you could want in an offensive tackle he's super physical he's big he's long he's athletic as all hell but you see in his technique where he struggles a little bit just he'll overset he doesn't have a lot of nuance in the pass rush game where you know he won't he won't mix up a circle punch with you know a snatch and the the kind of play that kind of back and forth game that just comes from experience Mm -hmm. blake fisher on the other hand is a guy that and, and this isn't me saying this. This is if you go to if you go to Lance Zerlin's page, he always quotes scouts. He said that between Joe Alt and Blake Fisher, Fisher's a more talented player, but he had nowhere the consistency of Joe Alt, and that's mm-hmm. why one's going to be a first rounder, top five pick, and one's going to be probably a third round pick. Right. So I'm not saying that he's as good. That's not what I'm saying. But in terms of his raw tools, and that's why I think Blake Fisher is a guy that will be a better pro than he is a college player. And I think he gives you a better ceiling or a better floor, sorry, right off the bat because of he's played right tackle. He's, you know, tried and true played at a big school. Notre Dame's a, a, is a wagon in producing offensive linemen. Um, So, you know, I think I'd go Blake Fisher here just because we really can't afford to fuck this pickup uh, at right tackle. And I feel like Blake Fisher doesn't have to worry about his technique transitioning and he can just mm-hmm. step in and just but and Kieran just went next. Get in there. But listen, Kieran is going to be a hell of a player. So it, it's just, it's all about what can he, do. I think he's going to struggle right away. I think mm-hmm. he's a guy that ideally you can red shirt. If he was the guy that we had long term to be our left tackle in, you know, a year and he didn't have to play in his first year, I would love that pick. But to ask him to go from playing left tackle in college over to right tackle for his first year pro where he's barely played in the last year and then back to left tackle next year. That's just a lot of movement for a young player. And I worry about that with someone as inexperienced as him. Yeah, it's a good point. And I think it, it would have been nice if, if uh, maybe do you think if we would have taken Kieran that any shot that, uh, that, um, uh, which McCall would have still been here. Blake Fisher would have still been here at 77. Just because I know the mock so well, like the machine, it's definitely possible. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I've reality. seen times where he's gone in the second round. So, um, okay. and we got, we got some really fun names here. Christian, yeah, what, Christian what Haynes is one of my guys. Really? Um, Cause Jimmy loves this guy too. I just didn't know. Is he big enough? Uh, I mean, he's coming in here to play in his own scheme. I think that's where they're transitioning to because, and I think what limits his size or limits the concerns around his size is that he's physical enough. Um, okay. he's one of the biggest finishers in this group. So even though he's a little short, a little lighter, mm-hmm. um, he plays much bigger than a size, but I, I just, it's, it's tough. I think with some of those other names that I'm seeing there to kind of go back into the O-line well as much as I'd like to and as much as I think we need to, especially to go get a true guard um, mm-hmm. this early, even though I do think Haynes is you know one of those high-level guys. Um, so I really like his game. Um, where's the name that just popped out to me when you were scrolling? It was down a little bit. for Austin Booker. Um, that's who I wanted to talk about. So that's a guy that, um, you know, I got, got to give the credit to, uh, Chris Aguilar and Michael Crawford put me onto this guy um, a while ago. And then when I got into his tape, I, I just had a lot of fun watching him. I think he's that type of guy that I'm talking about in terms of 
a guy that I think can play with power and hand power, but is also big, long, and has that ability to develop as a speed rusher and kind of become the complete package. So um, Austin Booker, it'd be between Christian Haynes and Austin Booker from what I see right away. And it's just basically, do you want to go get, you know, you just got Blake Fisher. Do you want to go get Christian Haynes? And then you've rebuilt your right side for the next few years to come. Um, or do you need to add to that edge room and, you know, support what you're doing with bringing Kyle Van Noy back and trying to get something out of, uh, out of, uh, a do- a Jabo. a Jabo, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's a, I, I think, I think with what they have at guard in house, I mean, I don't think that they've totally given up on, on guys like Ben Cleveland. And obviously th- at least if you follow their social media, it seems like they're pretty high on, on Andrew Voorhees and, and hopeful about what he can bring. So I think they, if faced with this, I'm going Austin Booker here. Now there's a guy I got to get your uh, take on, and I'm hopeful that he's still going to be available here coming up because people have put his name in our comments section a ton. And I know you, you absolutely have a, have a very strong opinion on him. And so I'm going to see if he's available here once our, our pick 93 is up. Um, I really like pick 93 and 113 for a corner. I think that's where you get a lot of really solid corner options that are going to fit what the Ravens want. And what the Ravens want is a guy that's going to be talented enough or that you're kind of getting in the top 100 picks um, that may have to play right away and isn't too much of a project. Um, mostly as injury, uh, like, you know, kind of that injury replacement if if one of their outside corners goes down, but also a guy that just has that long-term potential to start next year. Um, and I just think there's a number of guys that kind of fit that mold. Um, Cam Hart's the one I always kind of go to. I just, I love that kid's game out of Notre Dame. Um, Trey Benson's an interesting name too. Him and it's a, it's a heavy investment um, at running back, but love that guy's game um i'm always at this spot deciding between dj james and uh cam hart but i just have a soft spot spot soft spot for for cam hart he's he's a guy that um just intrigues the hell out of me cam i hart. usually take him at pick 113 um Where that's kind he? of been my target so is he on here still cam hart yeah he'll be lower that's that's what I mean. I've done this stupid mock draft machine. Oh, there he is. This your guy. <laughs> well, what about I didn't see his name. He's probably gone because I didn't see him pop up there. What's uh was it BB? Is that how you pronounce his name? Is it just BB? Cooper uh, Baby. Guard? Yeah, yeah Bebe. There it is. Okay. Yeah. yeah the, the guard. Uh people have been putting him in our comments section a ton as we as we've been talking. And I know you have uh you got a chance to get a good look at him. What's your thoughts on him? He very much fits what the Ravens have been drafting in at the guard position. Um, he's just kind of that, you know, long-term college player, was a star, made all of his all-conference teams All-American. Um, I just saw uh, Dominic Puny mentioned. Uh, he's also one of my favorites as well. Okay. Um, no, I like this kid. I just, my concern with him, and I, I talked about it a little bit when I was on with, uh, with Mink and Downing, people were very surprised at how well he tested because he was mostly seen as a gap blocker. And what I mean by that is he would fit better in Roman scheme than Munkins. Um, But then he tested so well athletically that it made you really think like, okay, maybe this kid can play a pretty diverse game, but he's just so experienced. Um, I was watching him uh, on one of his zone blocks the other day, just kind of, you know, throw out the slingshot technique. Um, And that's stuff that you see from seasoned vets and just seeing it from, from him at, in, at the college level, like that's the type of player he is super intelligent, super physical, one of the strongest players pound for pound in this draft. Um, mm-hmm. So definitely a guy that um, I would be interested in. Um, but not over, not over Cam Hart. Is that? No, I wouldn't take him that early. Not over okay. Cam Hart. Okay. Um, like Cam Hart a lot. Um, so and it really mentioned- comes down to some of these other guys like, do you want to go for the the stud running back to pair with Derrick Henry um, and kind of that overinvestment at running back? Uh, or do you want to just kind of stick with kind of your need proposition and, and get Cam Hart right in here and then you feel pretty good? Yeah, I think I think Trey Benson would be nice, but I don't I don't is, buy is Dominic it. Puny there? What is it? Dominic Green? He's uh Puny. P U uh, oh, P-U- P-U- oh yeah, he P-U-N-E. is. He is there. I saw yeah. him in there. Yeah. I saw Puny in there. Yeah. So the reason that I would go with this pick is because he's a guy that could play 
guard right away for you. Okay. But also provide some of that emergency tackle ability. Uh, so that's kind of the the bringing him in to compete with Voorhees and compete with Cleveland, I think is a really good kind of spot. And I think, you know, you've put yourself in a good position to then spend 113 on corner. We're not going to do it here because we're only doing three rounds. But when 113 rolls around, if I could go get Cam Hart and I've really now poured some good investment into my offensive line, uh, you know, I got a couple guys that, you know, and Puny could come in and compete at right tackle right away. Like, I think he's that good. I think he's going to be a guard at the NFL level, but um, I really like his game. So, um, you know, I really comes down to Puny versus Cam Hart. Um, for me, I, I also would factor in Trey Benson because I just love that pick. Um, I love what he could do with Derrick Henry. Um, so, yeah. Mm. You know, and I wonder what are you you thinking on this? Well, I I wonder what what Mitchell's contributions can realistically be this year with the late injury. So I I don't think it's unrealistic to say that they go with a running back. The question is, do they do do they go this high or they continue what they've done lately and go late round or undrafted? I tend to lean towards towards the latter, go toward go for a late round pick, maybe. Uh, but but ultimately, uh, I think they're definitely going to add to the room. Uh, I, I just I don't see it after the the Henry one. So I think they can they double down. I like this pick. I had him actually written down uh, as a third round pick uh, in one of our mocks already. Uh, I had him. I had Mahogany as one of them. Uh, and I had Patrick Paul. I don't know how I had Patrick Paul this low when he went way higher in this mock. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I did have him pretty high, but I, I like Dominic Puny. I had him in, in one of my previous mocks. So. I'm down with that pick. I feel good about what my offensive line competition is now with that pick. So I think that I makes know. sense. Yeah, let's see. Uh okay, no more picks. Let's see what our our grades are according to PFF. Let's see how good they think you did here, Cole. I'm I don't want to know what they thought of my trade back. I though I th- I think we rebounded. I think we rebounded well like yeah, pretty yeah. good. Or Leggett. Uh, yeah, I know. I think Steve Smith was really hype about that guy. I thought he was. I, I, I love that kid. Yeah, he's he's certainly an explosive. That's funny. Guy. I honestly didn't even, I didn't even remotely, he wasn't even in my head because I just thought he was gone. Wow, they really love Austin Booker, that selection. Yeah, and I think chat kind of called it that Blake Fisher pick. I think we panicked a little bit at tackle and went Blake Fisher. We might have been able to grab him at 77. Um, so I, I, I'll accept that C, but I also think if they don't go tackle with their first pick, mm-hmm. you're almost forced to go tackle with your second pick. That's a um, good point. cause you know, 15 picks between 62 and 77, if there's a tackle run, you're screwed. Like that's you right. don't have a starting right tackle that that's kind of the risk you run. Um, so yeah, I yeah. don't know. I like yeah. that a lot. I, I think if I'm coming, if I'm going into day three with this as my base, We've addressed our biggest needs, I think. Um, we still got to hit corner. We're probably going to have to hit safety, but I like the depth of those positions and kind of who's left. So I feel good about it. Um, yeah. Apparently, we're big Kansas Jayhawks fans. <laughs> it looks like it. And and do you do you look at Leggett as a guy who would who would uh, as the season goes on take take targets from Rashad Bateman or would he compliment Rashad Bateman? Because I think he would do. Obviously, Zay's going to get his target share, but the question is, does he eat into Bateman or does he work well with Bateman? Does he compliment him? It's just how much 12 are they going to play versus 11, I think is the question. And I think this gives you ultimate flexibility because, I mean, the other thing is they want to get Andrews involved. They want to get Likely involved. So mm-hmm. you can only have, you know, five positional players on the field at once. So, you know, do you want to go with the 11 personnel? And then, you know, you factor in they're going to play Ricard and that kind of, 21 12 look so um and you know they're gonna run the football like they always do so i think what this gives you is a lot of flexibility to play the game you want to play if it's a game where you can and and one thing that i want to point out that was a huge missed opportunity last year they were one of the most efficient teams running the football out of 11 personnel with three wide receivers and they had top five lowest usage doing that in those Hmm. situations. So they would come out in 11 and run it. Well, they did a ton with Keaton Mitchell, but they just didn't do it enough. Hmm. And when you get into a situation where you have three solid wide receivers, you're, you have to respect this deep speed as Zay flowers and Xavier Leggett. 
and you have Lamar Jackson's legs and you have Derrick Henry and you have Mark Andrews. It, it just creates a favorable situation for your offense. Cause you, what are they going to do with their lineup? Right. As long as they're, and that's why I like the idea of getting a guy like Leggett as, you know, a deep ball guy, a uh, guy that can stretch the field because if they can connect on those, that was the missing piece last year that, you know, when they hit on those plays, that's where the offense really hit its peak. Um, and it didn't happen early on. They kept pushing the ball to Bateman. They just, him and Bateman weren't on, on schedule with one another. Um, but I think by the end of this, like mid year, I think Leggett and Zay Flowers would be your starters and Bateman's kind of your, your third receiver working in. And, you know, if this was the case, if they ended up with this, you know, I don't even know if you'd see Bateman's fifth year picked up, right? Because he's probably going to be on his way out. Yep. And it could determine that that could be determined whether or not they get a receiver in this draft, whether or not they, they end up taking that uh, or picking up that fifth year. Cause I think they only have a month to make that decision. So really the only thing that's going to change is the draft and, and uh, yeah, to make that call. But I like this. I, I'm the, I, I think this would have uh, maybe not been the most popular draft as far as Ravens fans goes, cause they just want position talent, position talent, position talent. But look, there's another wide receiver is the first pick for the team. That should make some, some uh some fans uh some ha uh, some fans happy but they still got a lot of picks after this it's just a three round mock ladies and gentlemen they could still fill a lot of gaps uh it's certainly at the cornerback position like you mentioned safety uh they they could still get it done with the rest of their picks and uh yeah i i, I know and people love Coleman dude people love Keon yeah. Coleman they love him i mean it's fun. A, i like Coleman I, i'm a, i'm one of the bigger Keon Coleman fans um i just yeah, I'm not sure. You're a Leggett. Like, guy. I don't like him as much as Leggett <laughs> yeah. by a lot. Like, I think Leggett's way better, but. No, Dijon. Yeah, DK does not like. No, it does not like. That's not you? Oh, you're answering. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Who hit that? Who hit that? What, no, what, Dijon. What sports guru got against two Kansas Jayhawks? Why couldn't that happen? I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, we took uh, Travis Jones when he was coming out of. What was it, uh, UConn, when they had the, how many wins that year? I mean, look, you can still find good players on, on crappy teams. Don C says, Glenn, Cole, great mock uh, draft. Glenn, we need to send Cole an Orioles hat. I would love to hear Cole say, how about them O's in his Canadian accent? Yeah, let's see if he's got uh, – I can't do it. I'm a Jays fan, guys. What is this soy – who is that? Is that is that Jimmy? Jimmy Haskell, the rascal, infiltrating our chat and wow. confusing the hell out of me and confusing the absolute hell. I should have <laughs> known. He started speaking Spanish. How did I not immediately know that that was Jimmy? That is absolutely embarrassing. Jimmy, Jimmy's oh, texting from the trunk of my car right now. That's right. That's right. He's in here, he's in here trying to make sure he's not being replaced. That's what he's up to. My man is worried. Um, Appreciate it, Cole. Yeah. I would, are you uh, at all baseball guy, Cole? Not much. It's my, of the big four, it's my fourth. Um, okay. I'm a huge casual. Um, I will say I love watching what the O's are doing. Cause it's just, it's a fun rebuild story. Right. So just mm -hmm. from someone who appreciates the team building aspects, it's, it's fun to see, um, them draft and develop to build that team. I hate the Yankees as a team that kind of buys their talent. Um, so I'll always yeah. respect that. Um, but I am a Jays fan. Just, you know, I'm in Canada naturally Toronto's everyone's team. So, um, Mm -hmm. You know, I'll always have the Edwin walk off. <laughs> there you go. There, there you go. go. <laughs> you hang on to what we can but, take. Uh, we're just, we're just, we're just trash now. The they, they went with the core of Bichette and and Guerrero, and it's it's just they're, they they haven't been able to get over the hump, and they just I don't know. They just it's kind of a corny saying, but they just don't seem to have that dog in them to kind of get it done in the postseason. So. Unfortunately, yes. it's been a while since the the heyday with Bautista, which I know all you guys hate. And uh hey, I'm and Joey Benz. And, Punch me yeah. in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget when I'll never forget that video, man. Brunette Ordor giving him just a, a sock right in the kisser. I love to see it. Uh Cole, last thing I have for you. I got a quick question. Did you see Ayuk has scrubbed his social media of all 49ers? And I don't know if this was real or fake. You never know. But I thought I saw Lamar Jackson followed him. And so any chance when you know he's getting paid that Brandon Ayuk would be coming to the Ravens? 
I I don't know. I, I don't, but like I don't think the Ravens would do it. I probably would. I saw someone just ask, would you trade the first pick? I I'd trade my second round pick because you know we don't want to use that thing anyway. But uh, I don't know. It's going to be tough to use the first. But I, at the same time, I'd probably it, the problem is the contract implications. Like there's just only so many massive contracts. But God, would I love to have Aok here? But yeah, I kind of agree. Um, is Aok going to want to go to another run based offense? I I I, I don't know. Um, it's a yeah. fair point, but. Uh, you know, would I do it? Probably. But, you know, I, at the same time, you know, I remember everybody being like, oh, my God, Derrick Henry just followed Keaton Mitchell. And then the announcement came out, you know, a couple hours later. So who the hell knows what that maybe. social media stuff can actually mean? Yep. Maybe, maybe, maybe we we will. We will cer- <clears throat> certainly find out, I think, by the 28th. Uh, I think if there is a trade to be made uh, surrounding Brandon Ayuk, it will happen on draft night or before. But I think that's it for us tonight. Cole, thank you so much for standing in. Uh, I did see that Jimmy's last comment is that uh, the looks of the operation is missing, is what he's saying. So I guess uh, he's saying we're not good looking enough to hold down the fort, which you know hurts my feelings, Jimbo. I have you know. That hurt my feelings. Uh, but no, we certainly miss Jimmy, and we'll, we'll hope that he's back for the next episode. But Cole, you are the man. Thank you so much for, for jumping in. Guys, if you guys have not done it, I'm ashamed. Go over to Road Graders on YouTube and hit the subscribe button. Uh, he will make you a smarter football fan. There's no doubt about it. Um, but, Cole, I, I hope we can see you again shortly, certainly before the draft. But thanks again for stepping in. I appreciate you, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jimmy. Love you, buddy. Good luck with everything. And uh, thanks for having me on, guys. Looking forward to doing it again. Yes, sir. And we'll talk to you guys soon. See you.